I want to say welcome to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We are thrilled you're here. Okay, Tracy Goodwin, I got to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here today, and I'm already uh, really excited by the conversation we've already had. I know, and we haven't even gotten into it. I mean, no. I mean, this is the thing. Miko and I are just like, like I said, we're just raring to go um, to really learn from you and, and discover some new things. And so we're going to ask the question in just a moment. Do you have a voice mask? And then really taking this further and figuring out how we can connect with our donors, the people around us, our communities, using our voice. And what does that look like? So super exciting. Um, I, I, I witnessed to you that as we were getting started, I had to get Miko Marquette Whitlock as the co-host because I love his voice, right, Miko? So and, I, and I'm excited to be here. I had I was sort of interrogating you. I hope it didn't feel that way, but I felt like I was sort of peppering you with all these questions. But I'm excited to have the conversation. I'm excited to have you here, Tracy. Yeah, no, I I know I, I love it. Bring the questions. And we want to give our our gratitude to Bloomerang American Nonprofit Academy, nonprofit thought leader, staffing boutique. Your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, Tracy Goodwin, we got to start off with two questions. <laughs> One, do you like your own voice? And two, how did you get into this, this field of work? So yes, I love my voice. Good. <laughs> It, it is a 100% representative of who I am. And I believe that's the role of our voice. How I got into this work, my, my common answer is kicking and screaming, which is, is shocking to people. But I was raised, honestly, in a family where, and many, many people listening will probably relate to this, children are to be seen and not heard in an extreme version. And so yes. the thought that I would do this work felt felt not aligned and so i became an actor and a director and and people kept finding me to coach their voices and this was yellow pages days and so i i knew it was a it was a part of my purpose i knew the way i could hear sound i knew there were nuances that i understood and so by the time i was in my mid 20s i was coaching voices around the world wow now, Mika, I got to ask you, because again, I identify you very quickly with your voice and the power of that and how I'm attracted to that. Do you like your voice and do you think about your voice? I like my voice sometimes. I, I would say most of the time, but I'm, if I'm being honest, I think I, like many folks, probably have, um, you know, you have this this alter ego, for example, or you have this, this inner critic. Um, and so we as part of our life experience, we are navigating our relationship with that inner critic. And so I think there are moments where I, I love my voice. I think there are moments where I'm comparing myself to other people and like, wow, wow, I wish I could talk like that or do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just my honest assessment. <laughs> well, I I think it's great. And I, I, I love that you said that because I think it leads into Tracy's work and, and so let's start with the question spot on. What is a voice mask and how does it work? I have never heard of this concept before. So help us to understand this. So voice masks are like Halloween masks. They're meant to hide our identity, but they're invisible. They're just an armor of sound that we pick up and put on in certain circumstances. And we all have different circumstances. Some of us, sometimes we have a voice mask that we wear all the time. And I'll give you some examples. And I think you're going to really understand through these examples. One of the things that a lot of people feel like is they have to put on their professional voice. And I've got my professional voice mask on right now, Julia, and I sound fabulous, but you can't connect with me. And we wear this armor when we want to cover up our own insecurities, like maybe I don't know all the answers. Maybe I am intimidated. Maybe I do have imposter syndrome. So I figured this out many, many years ago 
with the first one I figured out, or this is what I identified them as, was a man came to work with me and he was struggling in his business. And I instantly could hear all over his voice that he was trying to prove something to me. Mm. And so that was the first voice mask I identified was needing to prove. And what was happening was he was trying to prove his worth is really what it was because he had a voice story. We'll talk about that when we get into some more of our conversation. He felt like he had to prove he was good enough and how his prospects were, uh, were processing that sound was, well, this guy's going to have to do everything his way. We're not going to get a say. We're not going to be a part of it. And they wanted to be a part of something. So here was this invisible armor, keeping people out, misrepresenting who the man really was. And it was costing him. So there, there are these, these sounds that we may not even recognize we're, we're tapping into and, and putting up, but they're costing us, most importantly, connection but they are misrepresenting the truth of who we are. They're the expression of our greatest insecurity. People pleasing is another one. If I'm a people pleaser, I might start making sure I'm doing a good job and you like me and I, I want you to like me, Julia and Miko. So I'm not going to show you who I really am because that might be too much. Oh, I don't want to be too dramatic. I don't want to be too much. So I'll just put my people pleaser mask on and it changes the whole dynamic. That's okay. so fascinating. I, I have so many questions. Can I dive in here? Yeah, okay. go. So <laughs> one like of the one of the things that comes to mind is the concept of code switching, where you speak differently in certain contexts. So you, if you think of a child or a teenager, maybe that, that speaks differently with their friends and they might mm -hmm. speak to a teacher or to a parent. Is that an example of voice masking or is that different? It could be an example of voice masking. I'm always interested in the why. Okay. Is the why, is there, I'm always interested in the behind, the behind, the behind. Is it a, is it a wound? Is it a fear of abandonment? Is it a fear of rejection? Is it a fear of judgment? Is it a, a worthiness thing or is it something else? Like if I'm just talking with my friends and we all talk like this, then that would be more in line with that code switching. If I'm feeling like you're intimidating and I need to get what I want and I can't really just show up and talk to you like this, then I'm going to put a protective mask on of some kind. So it's really about motive. I think Miko is, is my answer. So but it's, I got to believe we don't know we're doing this. You don't. Mm -hmm. It's it's the subconscious is is directing the whole show. And and the subconscious is doing that from the concepts of what I call psychology of the voice. No, when I bring it up to people and I will identify it, they will immediately identify with the concept of I'm a people pleaser or I'm trying to be professional or I have imposter syndrome, but nobody's thinking about it from the voice perspective, they're realizing it's a trait or, or something that, that they need to work on, but they're not realizing it's coming out in their voice. So okay. go ahead, Nico. So do you, so you, you mentioned the subconscious and I wonder if we could take a step back for folks that might not be familiar with that concept and unpack that. And as you're thinking about that, one of the thoughts that I have is is there a segment of the population that, that is moving through the world where we are, as individuals, unconsciously showing up with these masks and also unconsciously responding to the masks that other people are putting up? And so we we sort of create this, um, this loop that's probably not very helpful in terms of how we're connecting with one another. 100%. I believe if we can crack the masks, we can truly change the way we communicate because the mask represents that I'm communicating with you through my insecurity. I'm mm. comparing myself. I'm deciding you're smarter. I'm comparing that I'm not good enough. Um, mm. And it goes all the way back to before we're five years old. That's part of the concept of psychology of the voice is before we're five. And now actually my newest research is before we are two, we are 
one phrase, one phrase coming in, like, why, why are you being so much? And the two-year-old mind or the five-year-old mind, subconscious, subconscious is, is 100% focused on keeping us safe, keeping us from being judged, keeping us from being rejected or abandoned. It's sense of belonging. So that information comes in and the subconscious goes, right, okay, I get it. L let's adjust. And so you think about a lifetime of teachers and relationships and bosses and neighbors and coworkers even the ones we love and adore saying things and our subconscious constantly going, right, yep, okay, I've got it. I figured this out. First in dialects is how I came up with the, the understanding through the research that the subconscious was calling the shots because I was fascinated with why do the Irish sound Irish and I sound Texan. I want to sound <laughs> Irish. They sound really cool. Right. And I did some research on it and I discovered its sense of belonging. The sound comes in. The Irish, the Irish baby, here's the Irish mom or dad. And the, the subconscious goes, okay, I am literally going to tell the face how to hold the placement of the Irish dialect. So all mm -hmm. I have to do is shift my face. I shift the placement that is coming from the subconscious. So yes. I figured that out. And then I met a man named Bill who was not being heard in his company. And he, the day that I met him, I introduced myself. And he, he, you know, I said, hey, Bill, it's so great to meet you. I'm so excited to work with you. And he was this giant, uh, tall man. And he said, it's really great to meet you. And my first question was, do you have siblings? And he had, he said, six older sisters. They were constant. They loved him. They adored, they adored each other. But that information was constantly coming in. Why are you so loud? Get out of our room. Bill subconscious went, if you don't tone it down, you're going to be rejected by the people you love the most. And now here he was. And so it's happening to answer the question. Yeah, it's happening all day long, everywhere from these things that I call voice stories. And I don't really think it's intentional. I don't think people are going around going, well, I'm going to ruin her voice. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know, it's, I find what you're saying fascinating because Nico and I, I'm sure Nico, and again, I don't want to speak for you, but every day we are told in the nonprofit sector, you got to have the story. You got to have the story. You yes. got to tell the story. You got to be able to articulate in an elevator ride what the story is, mm -hmm. what your mission is. And it's this verbal communication that Nico, I don't know about you, but I feel like we are that rests heavy on our shoulders mm -hmm. that if we don't get that right, we're not going to be able to connect with our community of donors or funders and even our own teams. And so yeah. I find yeah. this to be just liberating and at the same time, frightening. Well, so that brings yeah. me to the next question though, which is sort of, so how do we become aware of these voice stories and if there's anything we need to do to to rewrite or change the story and maybe a second part of this is you know perhaps not everyone can work with you so like what are what are the other 99 percent of people who can't work with you like what do they do if they're listening to this and they're like oh my god I, you know i have a horrible voice story what do i do <laughs> yeah so a couple of things. I, I love what you were talking about, Julia, and that's a perfect example of we, we get under this tremendous pressure. And one of the first things that I hear people struggle with, and it dramatically affects their voice, is I've got to get it right. And I've got to say the right things. And I've got to tell the story. And I've got to, okay, that is automatically running the risk of putting someone in their head. And the minute we get up in our head, your voice cannot go to work. Your voice cannot bring, the voice is the orchestra of the heart. And so if I'm up in my head trying to get it right in, I wonder if they like me. And so here's some of these pieces and, and I'll tell you some of these pieces. And in that, I'll tell you what you can do if you, if you can't, that can't work with me. First and foremost, I tend to go against the grain of what the world says. And the world <laughs> says things like read the room, decide what they're thinking, change who mm -hmm. you are. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take that away immediately. Mm -hmm. So voice stories are the noise that and if, and now anybody it's this is one of those things you can't unsee, you can't unhear it. Anybody that's here today, you're going to spend the rest of the day hearing the noise in your head. And that noise might be you better get it right. They don't like you. What are you going to do now? Who do you think you are? Well, they're never yes. going to give you any money. Okay, we have to we don't have to do a deep dive on those. We mm -hmm. just have to recognize them and question them. Yes. Here's an example that I, in the, in the nonprofit space and, and in the, all the spaces, anytime we talk about sales, a lot of people have a story that says, I don't want to bother them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to bother that. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't know. You see, eh. so we automatically start shifting our voice. I would say this about voice stories. We have to recognize them and we have to question them because the subconscious is always going to play the safe card. The subconscious does not want you heard. The subconscious does not want them the, your fullest expression because the it subconscious- wants to keep you safe. Yeah. It's about safety. So yeah. if you are running in your head and here's another one, well, I don't want to be salesy. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, is that ultimately true? Is that ultimately true? You're going to be salesy. Well, no. Do you have any proof? Well, no. Well, or maybe you say yes. Okay. Here's the second piece to that. If you have proof or wherever that story came from is in the past, the okay. judgment and fear of it all going off the rails is in the future. So shockingly for people, the first thing that I have to do with them is get them in the now. Because okay. if I am deciding, oh no, Julia's not happy that she brought me on the show. I better do something interesting now. I better change who I am. And, I get, and I'm going to go to change it. But the world taught us, read the room, decide what they're thinking. And I don't completely take that away, but I think we have to do it different. Because at the end of the day, I'm completely handing you my voice power if I've decided what you're thinking about me. So I've got to question those stories. I've got to be present. And I've got, I call it bringing the tentacles in. I've got to bring my tentacles in and I've got to buy into the value that I can bring you. And when I work from that, rather than something outside of me, now I stand a chance of showing you who I am. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple of starter points. Okay. You rocked my world. I'm going to say... <laughs> This is like a hair on fire episode for me, which I am like, I'm just devastated. We only have about 10 more minutes because I have so many more questions. And I know Miko. Yeah, I do too. Got, I'm taking gotta, notes. <laughs> yeah, we got to We got to get this. We got to get you back on to explore some, some other things. Sure. Talk to us about the voice cost. Mm. And, and then you identify influence, impact and income. And you're saying, 30 to 90% of what these, these situations are, are being impacted. Yes. What does that look like? So there's multiple studies I've done on this concept to be able to come up with that figure. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the things that I see people, well, masks play into it because let's say I've got a voice mask of needing to prove and that kind of irritates you, but maybe you're really my person. Maybe you really love my organization and you want to give me a lot of money, but I'm really, really rubbing you the wrong way because I'm trying to prove, okay, you don't know the backstory. You don't know that I'm trying to prove my worth to my father or whatever it is, whatever that voice story is. So voice masks significantly play a role in this because masks block connection within 2.5 seconds we need, according to the research study that I did last year, I need to be able to connect with you in 2.5 seconds. If I can't, we're looking at 30 to 90%. But here's another example. People will pick up one voice habit. Like, let's say everything I say is really fast and I'm going to talk the rest of our time together really fast because I really want to hurry up and get to the other side of this and see how I did and see if you like me. And I'm going to hurry up and talk really fast because you all are all looking at me. Everybody has a voice aversion, meaning I can't handle loud all the time. That's my voice aversion. So if you spend the rest of the interview yelling at me or being loud at me, I'm not going to buy from you. I'm not going to donate to you. So we get stuck on this one note 
And we sometimes don't even realize we're doing it. And we hammer that note and the person really was ours. They really came into the conversation going, I love what this organization's doing. And then we, and then we are loud the whole time. Or here's another one. Because of voice masks and voice stories, we don't give the fullest expression of who we are. So today you see how dramatic I am. And this is really who I am. I'm larger than life as a human. I really express myself this way. If I wasn't playing those notes, I call them because I'm in front of a professional audience. And so I may not put on the professional mask, but I don't want to be too much. And so I'm going to water down everything. And you're over there thinking, I really need some, really want to donate to an organization that's passionate. And I just watered that down 30 to 90% deciding what people are thinking. We can neutralize everything we say. And I can't make that impact without that reveal of who I am, that truest authenticity. I can't influence you if I can't make you feel. And if I stay in the neutral zone because I don't want to rock the boat and I don't want to be too much for your audience, then I've missed influence. Then I've missed impact. Then I've missed income. So- yeah. There's a million things we can do with our voice that misrepresent us, can even repel. So really what we're after is connection and authenticity. Yeah. And I, I think you just sort of hit the nail on the head and that the tool, the, the voice is a tool mm -hmm. for that. And mm -hmm. I guess as we begin to wrap up, you know, Julie, if it's okay, I have just yeah. two more questions. Go, um, go. The first is... How, how do, how does this, um, what does this mean for people that have a disability, for example, um, that may have a speech impediment or some other disability that requires maybe an assistive technology? And then the, I guess the last question is really about what, what is, what is it that folks should know about the use of AI, particularly mm -hmm. in the voice realm, given what you just said about connection and authenticity? Mm -hmm. So to answer the first piece, I think it's still about show us who you are. Mm -hmm. I think for everyone, we get caught up with, we might get caught up in, I have a stutter or I have, uh, it could be any disability. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I've got people without a disability that are processing the same thing. It's that I don't want to sound too much. I want to make sure I sound smart. I, to me, we have to, this is the goal in my mind is if that is a piece of who you are, let me have that. Let me have that. Let me hold that because that is what I can connect with. That is authentically you. So I think for everybody, disability, no disability, we have to stop covering up who we really are. Hmm. The interesting thing about AI and I tend to really love to talk about things I have researched and quantified. And I'm getting this question around AI a lot. And I haven't done a lot of extensive research to it yet, but this is what I can say. Number one thing I'm being asked today by prospects is how can I sound authentic in an AI world? So it is very much in the forefront mm. of everyone's mind. And my response right now based on the limited research that I've done is that is actually the driver of the research that I see around connection and authenticity. People are leaning in more than they've ever leaned in before. They subconsciously processed sounds before. We know that from my research, from science's research, we know that yes. it's now becoming conscious. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning in to hear are you my person? I'm leaning in to hear, do you get me? I'm leaning in to hear what is the full experience of working with your organization for a year when I give you a large donation. I need to know that. And that's what I see people doing right now. So I think AI is actually going to exacerbate that, our personal desire for more connection and more Often, truest authentic. I want to hear all the sounds of who you are. Yes. Hopefully, that answered those questions for you. 
Yeah, and it's it's um I'd be interested if we have you on for another conversation to follow up on this. Cause I think with AI in particular, it can be a double-edged sword, right? It can be a tool to help someone that has a speech impediment, for example. Um, it can be a learning tool for I don't know, creating ebooks, summarizing things, that kind of thing. Um, but on the other end, it can also be deceptive, right? People can use it for for not so great things. And so I I, yeah. I think you've given us a lot to chew on here. And that's definitely where my responses are coming from, from that place of people's concern over deception. I'm not anti-AI. Like you said, I think it's amazing and extraordinary. I think it's create, and, and for like what you said, people with disabilities, yes, that is in my mind different than the people that are going, is this real? Are you, is this ad real? Is this person real? Is this a, that's where the concern is what I see happening now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, uh, you know, in the nonprofit sector, we, we use the number 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country. So there's a lot of competition and there are a lot of nonprofits doing the same work with similar names or sometimes similar names at different parts of the country mm -hmm. that are doing different work. But when we're trying to align ourselves to potential donors or we're communicating, uh, these are some of the things we need to be thinking about um, as we you know, open the doors to a different relationship that we might have with donors, especially as we go across you know, the digital age and, and really lean into some new opportunities that we didn't used to have, right? And so I think this has just been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Um, we do, Miko, buddy, you and I, we got to get her back on because <laughs> I, I can, I'm, I'll, I'm already thinking as I journey through my day, I would imagine over the next eight hours, I'm going to have so many more questions that like pop into my head about some of the things that you said. And, um, I had never aligned and Miko really quickly, I'd love your, your comment on this. I'd never aligned to this like backstory or fear or our own yes. messages in our head relating to our voice. I never had connected that. It I completely makes sense. I mean, it, it and what you talk about in terms of the subconscious, I talk about it a little differently, but, um, but it, it's essentially the same, right? We're talking about vibration, right? The voice is one of those mechanisms by which we share and sense vibration we connect with with one another but when you think about just think about all the five senses mm -hmm. you know it's it those are all the ways in which we show up and experience the world from the human perspective uh, and so what you're sharing if you, if you think about it just from that perspective it it completely makes sense and once you're aware of that now it so like how do we become more mindful and more intentional about how we are tapping into this beautiful experience that we have to connect with one another yeah. Wow. And beautifully said, Miko, beautifully said. Tracy Goodwin, Captivate the Room, Captivate the Room podcast. If you go on to Tracy's website, which is beautifully done, CaptivateTheRoom.com, you can access her whole archive of amazing guests and uh, the podcast format that she has created and, and continues to steward. Um, there are a lot of great articles and pieces of her life that she shares and talks about this amazing thing to consider. Um, again, Tracy, we were saying in the green room chatter, you know, more than a thousand shows in five years. This has never been a topic we've we've addressed. We've never had an expert to come on and, and discuss this with us. But more importantly, we haven't even <laughs> we haven't even opened the door to this notion at least me so i have really enjoyed this it's been a tremendous uh tremendous lesson and i know we'll connect. yeah we'll connect with you more because uh so many more questions and we want to uh, get to this drill down on this definitely another thing we want to make sure that we express is our gratitude to our amazing sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy nonprofit thought leader staffing boutique your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, 
JMT Consulting and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these fabulous conversations. Wow. Okay. You've like changed my life and the way I'm hearing myself. I have a lot of work to do. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you so much. I've just loved being here with y'all and I'm glad that I, I'm glad you found it so valuable and interesting. It's a totally different way to look at it. We, we just don't even think about it this way. And that's, it's, it's, I just, I'm in love with this work. I'm in love with this concept. I'm in love with the research and it's just, it's a game changer. It is. Absolutely. Well, we are thrilled that you would come on the nonprofit show and share your knowledge and your talents and your insight with us. As we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we leave you with this message and we leave you with this message every day. And I hear it differently, especially today. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again.